Hallelujah. Amen. You know, I didn't even remember that passage. Woo! I'm excited. Amen. When I was hungry, you sent me Washington State dried apple. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's way too cool. <laughs> Brother Gabby, I need you to come up and read the passage for us. And Brother Benga, once he finishes, you come up and read it too. You know the scriptures teach us, pay attention. Pay attention to the reading of the word of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If you're excited, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, um, I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, this is the one to the end. I read. The person should consider us in this way as servants of Christ and managers of God's mysteries. In this regard, it is expected of managers that each one of them be found faithful. It is of little importance to me that I should be evaluated by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even evaluate myself, for I am not conscious of anything against myself. But I am not just I'm not justified by this. The one who evaluates me is the Lord. Therefore, don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the hearts. And then praise will come to each one from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefits, so, so that you may learn from us that, that saying, Nothing beyond what is written. The purpose is that none of you will be inflated with pride in favor of one person over another. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you did not receive? If in fact you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have begun to reign as kings without us. And I wish you did reign, so that we could also reign with you. For I think, I think God has displayed us, the apostles, in last place, like men condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Up to the present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed, roughly treated, homeless. We labor, walking with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we respond graciously. Even now, we are like the world's garbage, like the dead everyone scrapes off their sandals. Verse 14. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. For you can have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you, can, you can't have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Therefore, I hold you to imitate me. This is why I have sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful son in the Lord. He will remind you about my ways in Christ Jesus, just as I teach everyone in every church. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. 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 Praise God. Hallelujah. I read from the book of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is a uh, six through the end, which should be verse 16. Good thoughts. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, 
and exercise that same rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptations. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youths, but be thou an example of the believers, in war, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention, I mean, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Verse 14. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying of the hands of the prosperity. <clears throat> Meditate upon these things. Give thyself only to them, that thou profiting may appear to her. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing so, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Amen. 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 Now, when you read that, sometimes you say, oh, he's just talking to pastors. Um, but I hope you understand that in a way, you are a pastor in your own context. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You agree with that? If you agree with that, can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Now, listen to this. Uh, my topic, I know our time is fast spent, but I will try to wrap it up. I felt the Lord laid this on my heart. And I would like to share it with you very quickly. Um, how do we serve our own generation? How do we serve God in our own generation? If you note in today's written, uh, reading, the great apostle described ministry in First Corinthians chapter 4. <laughs> and every time I read a passage, I wonder what happened to ministry. It's like uh, when we think about ministry, we don't think of it in terms of First Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, who we think of ministry in the context of hunger. We we'll think of ministry in the context of being made to look like a fool. Who wants to look like a fool? We we'll think of ministry in the context of uh, uh, being despised, dishonorable. In, you know, every time I read the aspect where Apostle Paul talks about nakedness, it's like, no, 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 you cannot be, you cannot, that cannot be real. But it is. We have it both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. If it didn't happen, Apostle Paul would not tell us, would not write it then. You know, can you imagine getting into a situation where you have it, ah, remove your trousers, remove your pants. Remove your pants. You, you, this foolish pastor. Remove your pants right now. I said, ah, please let me keep my... <laughs> Remove your pants. And you are paraded naked mm. in the midst. That's Apostle Paul's experience. Homeless. Buffeted. Laboring. Walking with your own hands. You know. Dara was telling me how busy this week was. Uh, uh, how busy it was at work. And yet, you have spiritual responsibility. Uh, by the way, that's not new, dear pastor. That's ancient. It's part of the deal. <laughs> Apostle Paul said, I live more. I walk with my hands. I did. I labor. And then after laboring that hard, you expect people to say, oh, what a wonderful pastor, pat you on the back, and maybe even rub your head a little bit. Is that what happened afterwards is I was reviled. 
reviled. Who loves to be reviled? Ah, I was reviled. I, I was persecuted. I was defamed. They said I did what I did not do. <laughs> I was treated as a field, as the offscoring of all things. What a, what a call. What a call. And then at the end of uh, First Corinthians chapter 4, he said, this thing I transferred in a form to Timothy. Ah, so I said, let me go and look at what he has to say to Timothy. And the main thing in that book, First Timothy chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4. Young people, don't ever forget. That is the definition of ministry according to St. Paul. You know, all this interesting definition of ministry. Say, oh, God has called me into the ministry. And then you're beginning to see 10,000 people in a stadium. Oh, I just slept and I dreamt and there were 10,000 people. You might, you might be on a roll along a, a challenging slope. That's not it. If God brings it, praise God. If he doesn't bring it, amen. Amen. Right? Amen. You know, I, I, I have it on authority that Apostle Paul never had a large congregation of believers. Anytime he's given a good congregation, it's those who want to kill him. <laughs> he's very good at gathering a large congregation of those who want to kill him. You know, but he, but he never really had a large congregation of those who agreed with him. Mm. Whenever there's a large congregation with Apostle Paul, they are trying to kill him. Mm. <laughs> you know, well, but that's by the way. He said to, to Timothy, he said, let no man despise your youth. Be thou an example. Let, let me get there in a minute. You know, um, in the 70s, some good people watched a music which stuck in my head till this day. Let no man despise your youth, my friend. It's an American group. We, we used to listen to it in Nigeria. Let no man despise your youth. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Be thou an example, my friend. Of all that believed in your word and in conversation, you know, it's, it's another age. Mm. You may not like it in this generation, <laughs> <laughs> but we loved it. You know, wow! Let no man despise your youth. Refuse profane. An old wives faithful. There are stories and propositions that you as a pastor, as a leader, as a as a faithful person must refuse. You must just say in your heart, that's what that's good. Continue with your story, but I'm not having it here. Amen. Amen. You know, when I was a young pastor, you will have to prove yourself a thousand times before I will allow you to preach from my pulpit. You see, because I have a responsibility for that pulpit. You see, so I am not the person that uses special program to grow my church. Maybe you would have noticed it here too. At, you know, I, I stick to a very small set of friends <laughs> that we have been together for long. You see, because you will give an account on the final day of the food you fed the people, you will give an account. In this church, I think it's only one person that I brought that I regret, that I allowed that I regret. And it's because of people pressure that I allowed it. Niji is laughing. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> you know. But the people who, who stand here, no one has come and stood here that we brought, that you guys are not being blessed by. Am I right? Amen. It's because of, it's based on relationship. We are not trying to use uh, 
people to gather crowd. You don't have a relationship with someone. You're just going all over the place. It brings all kinds of fables and it scatters your church. If, even though your church is already scattered, it looks as if it is growing. And you're already scattered. May God have grant us an understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm saying this to Taiye, to Kainde, to Idogu, to Nima. Because in 10 years down the road, you'll be leading a church. Amen. Amen. To uh, to uh, Amen. <laughs> you may not be leading a church today, but you are on that road. You will get there. Amen. 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 Adalbi said to me, he said, I read the whole of Proverbs at the city. He said, my head exploded. <laughs> I said, you should have read the whole of the prophets along with it. He said, I can't contain it. <laughs> she said to me, I can't contain it. You will. Mm. The day is coming. You will. She said, there's too many things to understand there. I don't think I can comprehend it. I said, good. You are beginning to know him. It's because you don't know him until you get to know that you don't know. And that he has to help you. And he has to help expand your horizon. I, right, I don't take him for granted. You read the scriptures and your mind explodes. And you're wondering, I, I thought I've read this a hundred times. And then you read it again and you're seeing something else. So I'm talking to you because in a few days you will be in my place. Amen. Very few days. And then who knows what God will do. You know, so don't think that I'm targeting this prayer, Brother Jude and Brother Gabi and Dara and uh, um, and Chiedu and uh, Nia. No. Actually, it's you that I'm targeting more than them. They don't know what they are doing now. They're in trouble. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Amen. I believe they know what they're doing. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know, I, I would try to go quickly, but I don't know how to. Pray for me. He says, bodily exercise profited little. See, you, you know, but godliness is profitable unto orphans. Uh, let me see what I want to. He said, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, not to the people who attend. Your attention is to what? Reading, exhortation, and doctrine, not to the number of people in the seat. Mm. What if God sends you to just one person? What if you are Philip in that city and there was a big revival going on and God took him from the midst of a revival and took him along the road to Joppa to meet just one person. And the person said, how can I understand? If I, and Philip said, that's why he brought me. And he explained to him through the prophets. He explained to him from Genesis to Malachi how Jesus was sent to save the earth. Amen. And the fellow said, now what is stopping you from baptizing me? Wow. In one explanation, well, in one tutorial class, in one encounter, and, and Philip said, you think you are ready? He said, ah, this is what I baptized me. The fellow was the one that was asking for baptism. And Philip baptized him. And the moment the guy came out of the water, the spirit took Philip and took him away. Mm. And the last we had of Philip was that his daughters, his three daughters were prophetess. You will hand over something good to the next generation. Amen. We didn't hear anything about him again. <clears throat> After, but you and myself know that the Ethiopian church is still alive today. Yep. The church in that other city, what's the name of the city? Where, where Philip was holding massive citywide crusade. Is that church still alive? Al Qaeda has taken the place over. But the two pure church, one man, that church is still alive today. 
So the Bible didn't say give attendance to the number of people that come into your church and break your head if they, it is not increasing. Because we have this church growth model that is, uh, can be a little ungodly. Now, I'm not against church growth. Please don't misunderstand me. May God cause this church to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people in Jesus' name. Amen. May God prosper his people and bring many to here. But it is not an idol for us. If God sends us to one, we go. Amen. If he sends us to a thousand, we thank him. Right, right. You, you understand? Actually, the privilege of speaking to a thousand is so that, that you can be a multiplier. So it's not because you are how great I am. No. Look at our Father in the Lord, Adipoye. Look at how many people he mobilizes a year to go and be agents of the scriptures. That is what crowd is useful for, to mobilize others to serve God. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I have lost my train because I don't even know how to get in. It's already 15 minutes, but this is on my heart. These are the commandments that operationalizes the call to serve. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 16. First Corinthians chapter 4 describes the condition of service. You know, when you are employed. You are given a condition of service. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, I, I have the privilege now of, of writing employment letter to people. And I'm scratching my head here. How do you do this? Uh, what do you put in? Uh, what is the uh, five cost rate? What is the 401k? What is this? Now, all of a sudden, I'm having headaches that I don't know exist in the past. Praise the Lord. Maybe I need to speak to some tongue right now. That's our specialization. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'm asking questions that you should not ask publicly. <laughs> because people say, huh? You don't know that? I, say, I don't know. Praise God. Yeah. So, our condition of employment as ministers of the gospel is where? False Corinthians 4. four. Our operational faculty policy is where? First Timothy 4. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I hope I'm not boring you. But above all of those, I want to emphasize to you that every one of those become meaningless without the fire within. Everybody say fire within. Fire within. Is it burning in your belly? There was someone here who feels the fire. It's not my fire. Not my fire. You cannot survive on my fire. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It has to be your fire. The fire within. Amen. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, stoke the fire. Stoke the fire. Stoke the fire. It's your light. It's not my light. Let it shine. You must let it shine when you're stretched out, when you're beat down, when you're pressed out of shape. You must shine. I will give you seven ways to do that. But before I go there, I must ask you to reject the assumptions of a culture war. Reject the assumptions of a culture war. Can you all say with me, reject the assumptions? Reject the assumptions. I wrote this yesterday as I flew into Seattle, but I want you, uh, I woke up this morning to this outlandish claim in my email. Can you please put up the next slide? It should be there. Can it is it there? Yes. Okay, can you we put up the next down. slide? I woke up this morning to <laughs> they claim that se se 17 southern states have applied to secede from the union because of they lost an election. 17 southern states 
And they are serious about it. Oh. They have gone on the White House website and made a formal application to Obama's office to secede peacefully. Can you put that up? It should be the next slide. We the people, your voice in our government. White House. You know, this is a beautiful country. <laughs> Shout hallelujah for America. Hallelujah. America is the only place you go to the president and say, I want to leave your state. <laughs> you, you go and do that in Egypt. <laughs> or go and do it in Iraq or Iran. <laughs> They will tell you that you you are a dead man. <laughs> you know, they, they, they are serious about it. Fifteen states, I think sixteen as of as now, have petitioned the White House to secede from the <laughs> from the Union. Forgetting that a few hundred, a few decades back, there was a battle that was fought on this same issue. So if they fight them. Would they be unwilling to fight now? <coughs> May God have mercy. Amen. But when they were presenting this to you and myself three weeks ago, did they present it as a battle of secession? When they co-opted the old man who sat alone, gently in his house, eating his bread, wondering why he's 96 years old and have not met his savior, when they went to meet him and said, come and join us, was this the plan they presented to him? This culture war is not your war. Maybe there are pastors who will hear this on, online. The culture war is not our war. It's not our war. Can you say it with me? It's not our war. It's not our war. <laughs> And I believe with all my heart that the Lord is calling the church to choose the option of Daniel. Righteousness can flourish in Babylon. This war is not our war. Oh, they are gay. Oh, it is a portion. Oh, it's biblical value. Oh, family value. The person that managed a billion dollars that went down the drain, what is the sexual orientation of her, his child? Is his child not an openly lesbian person? But they come to us craftily and use our language and turn their own world into our war, refuse to fight as a few foot soldier in a war that God has not called you to fight. Love your neighbors, gay, straight, lesbian, homosexual. Love your neighbors. Let the heart of love explode within yourself. Jesus was so friendly with the outcast that they turned to him and said, he's a friend of wine bibles. They said to my Lord, you are a drunkard. 1979, traveling between Ife City and Ondo City, Nigeria, reading my living Bible translation. When I got to that passage, I I, I, it, my head exploded. My head exploded. I, I, I couldn't do anything but cry for three hours nonstop. You, I, you know, the big picture of a wine biber came into my face. It hit me right in the nose. Mame Mulayembi. Mame Mulayembi. Boy, I walk in Mulano, my Mebula, Yippee. Drunkard! They called my Lord. Drunkard! That's what they said he was. And all I could do was cry. Just cry, just weep. Just weep. Just weep. You know, my father had a drunkard in his employment. 
So I knew. I knew. I knew. When he's coming back from the farm, he helped my father to watch over his estate. You say, Ogele, Ejile, Ejiao, Ogele, Oliver, I can't man, I can't man, I can't man, What he said was saying, whoever says Emmanuel should not drink, something should happen to him. Then I'm going to drink. Ah, ah, ah. And then he comes in home. So I knew what it means to be a drunkard because I grew up seeing one, one of my father's employer, employees. But that's what they call my Lord. We have raised the holy man who will be recognized as a friend of gay and lesbian as a friend of those who choose abortion and are in sorrow that they cannot express to you. No woman kills her own child without feeling the sorrow. Forget about the political bravado show. Deep down, inside, there is pain. We are not called to fight this culture war. We are not called to fight this culture war. We are not called to fight it. Huh? When did Jesus rise up against the Herod? When did Paul steer a negation of Roman rule? You must be careful, my dears, to submit the church to those driving an agenda of hate. We are not haters. We are lovers. Amen. We are not haters. We are lovers. Amen. We love the gay. We love the lesbian. We love the straight. We love those who have committed abortion. We love. We love. We love. Can you say amen to that? Amen. We love. We love. We, we must stand up against those who use the Bible whenever it suits them. We must choose rather the option of Nehemiah. Nehemiah said I was the king's cup bearer. Nehemiah chapter 11, uh, chapter 1 verse 11. I was the king's cup bearer. Do you realize that the king of Babylon, the drink that he drinks must first be offered to idols? How does a devout Jew serve in that context? So when they finish offering the drink to old Maduk, Oh, great Maduk, here is the drink for the king. Then they bring the king. Oh, Nehemiah, holy man, drink out of it before the king drinks. And the fellow takes it. Oh, it's okay. Then give it to the king. And then the king can drink. Nehemiah said, ah, it is food of heart to idol. I cannot touch it. Am I right? I, Nehemiah. I was the king's of Biara. And he wrote it down. And the Bible says that is the word of God. The wine that was offered to Madoko. They give it to Nehemiah. He drinks. And then the king can drink. Let's not participate in the foolish culture war. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Sidestep it. It is not the gospel. Can you say amen to that? Amen. You see, because what they are doing is they are giving us a name that we are not. Now when the majority of young America look at the church, what is, do they see us as? Hate us. Let's face it. Let's face it. That's what the way they see us. Hate us. They don't want any part with us. Is that what we are? Is that what we are? Flying across this continent. Ah, I, I believe the Lord opened my eyes to see a land that is waiting for the downing of a new morning. I believe the Lord opened my eyes to, to see a, a, a new land. 
to a child child to an untutored person when you look at this land you see a land that is covered with darkness they say, oh the gays have taken over the nation oh the lesbians they are the one ruling what is your business with that you're looking with the eyes of a child oh they're like liberals they will not allow us to do what we want but the quiet seeker of Jehovah, the one who is asking God to show him that which is not obvious, the one who is seeing the unseen, the one who is assessing the invisible, I tell you, my brothers and sisters, this is a season of change, a season where history is being rewritten. I cannot emphasize it good enough. God is looking for people who will be Daniels in this generation. And I am Daniel. I prayed and I worshiped the Lord three times a day in Susa. That is the headquarter of idolatry. I prayed and I worshiped the Lord three times a day. I opened my windows to Jerusalem. I arranged that my office would be located at the face that is facing the temple. And I opened my window three times a day and I prayed and I prayed so much that the whole nation noticed. The Lord opened my eyes to see in the midst of darkness as I flew 30,000 feet above the sea level, I saw a light glowing in the midst of darkness. I saw it expanding and increasing and expanding and increasing. Brothers and sisters, it is your turn to shine. It is your turn to shine. Yeah, I hope you will shout a louder amen. I hope you will stand up on your feet and say, it is my turn to shine. It is my destiny to shine. It is my turn to be glorified. Somebody should say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That light is in your bosom. Amen. Jesus. Receive it. Maybe sit tight. That light is in your bosom. I believe that God has called you to be a representative of a generation. Don't fight the culture war. Don't go into the valley of, oh no. Oh no. They have taken away our land. Oh no. They have come with the liberal agenda. Oh no. Be like Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, a prophetess was employed to trap Nehemiah and bring him to the valley of Ono. Don't, don't go there with them. Be like Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, I'm not going. Let me read it to you. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10 to 14. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. People have agenda, brothers and sisters. Be wise. Read between the lines. People, especially political people, they have agenda. And they said to Nehemiah, let us meet together in the house of God, within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They sowed the seed of fear. Does it look like what has been going on a few days from now? They sowed the seed of fear. Indeed, at night, they will come, they will kill you. And Nehemiah said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there, such as I will, who, as I, who will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because to be a and Sambalat had hired in my daughter Kenichi and myself sat at table a few weeks ago. By the time I finished with her, I could see confusion all over her face. Because I was telling her on my table, I said to her, God has not sent them. Am I right, Kenichi? You're right. And she, said, she looked at me with confusion. And I said, God has not sent them. I said, they will fail. 
that we fail in the agenda. I said that we fail. Amen. The way it's already done. <laughs> you know, when everybody in my in my office in Dallas, everybody stood up. You know, Dallas people, they are very good Republicans. They are trying to secede now. <laughs> you know, and everybody stood up and said Obama has ended and what, what not. I said to them, it's a lie. I stood among them there. I said, it's a lie. I don't agree with every position Obama takes, but I thank God I've sent him. I can't explain it. I'm not a politician. I said to them there, I said, you may, they said, we vote on principles. I said, tell me what principle you are voting on. Oh, we don't support abortion. I said, your candidate happens to invest in abortion. What are you going to do about that? He doesn't just support it. Even though he says with one mouth, I don't support it, he uses his money to control it nationally. And not even the nice part of abortion. You know, there is a nice part of abortion. There is a very unnice portion of abortion. The disposal of fetus. I said, I said the Lord has not sent them. And my daughter, I don't know, she, I, I felt that day that, oh, Lord, help me. I hope I've not hurt this young woman. But I felt I had to tell her the truth as I see it. Here is it in the space. I perceived that God had not sent him at all. But he pronounced this prophecy against me because somebody paid them to buy a sambalat and I had them. <laughs> For this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way and say, so that they might have cause for an evil report that, uh, that they might reproach me. My God, remember Tobiah. Remember Sambalat. According to their words and the prophetess Noediah and the rest of the prophetess who would have made me afraid. One billion dollars. That was a cost at which they hired people to change our minds. One billion dollars. I would say something about that in a few days. One billion dollars. One billion dollars are be ending soon. We must avoid this culture war. It's not our war. Say with me, it's not our war. Not our we war. must avoid it. Do not allow false prophets to lead you into a false culture war. Find rather Jehovah's work site for your life. Stay there. Work hard. Choose to, to be a theocrat. That's on the only crack that I'm a part of. If you're talking about God, I'm in that party. Avoid culture war. If they bring it to your doorstep, fight it with weakness. You say, what? Pastor Shiro, I don't have time to explain that. Fight it with weakness. Don't fight it like, oh, we are going to go and take a signature. We learn from our Father in the Lord. Fight it with weakness. Allow the God of creation to fight on your behalf. Among the billions that they poured into the culture war in these past few months, how much have they poured into the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? A billion dollars, down the drain. You could see confusion on the face of one of their leaders on the television. Because 300 million dollars came from him alone. Him alone. 300 million dollars. He couldn't believe it when they said, when they said Obama has won Ohio. He was totally confused. He said it's not possible. It was on national television. He said it's not true. He said they are miscalculated. He said they should go back and re read it again. He said they are, it has not been called. There was total confusion on his face because three hundred million dollars. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. This thing is dead. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How much have they poured? into compassion for the helpless. How much? Let's assume they are not Christians. How much have they poured into compassion for the helpless? How much? This war is not our war. Can you agree with me? Yes. Yet they drafted the evangelical church. They drafted the evangelical church and they involved us 
in a world that is not our own. They turned us into their surrogates. They turned us to their foot soldiers. And you know the biggest loser in the last war that we just fought? You know the biggest loser? It's not the people that has money, that spent a billion dollars. It's the, part, the way the larger society now see the church. That's the biggest loss. Retrogressive, unwilling to engage with reality. That's the way they see us now. May God have mercy on us. <clears throat> May God have mercy on us. Amen. We lost the war. We lost it very badly. Those who crafted the message in our words. <clears throat> and we bought a lie from them. They have no interest in the goal of our king. The goal of Jesus is not in their interest. They have now handed us what I call an historic confusion, which we now have to manage. Now they have handed us an historic confusion, a mess that we have to deal with for a generation. You see, statistics says that if you vote twice for a president or a position, that that position is stuck with you for the rest of your life. If you vote three times in a row for a position, it's difficult to change that generation. Obama 2008, the vote of the young people went which way? 2010, uh, takeover of the, of the House of Congress, the vote of the young people went which way? Not the way that we wanted to go. Obama 2012, the vote of young people went which way? They are stuck. It's so difficult to move them again from that position. That is what statistics says. So we have been stuck with what I call an historic of confusion. We have been labeled as what we are not. <laughs> now they call us haters. I want you to think about that word. Think about it. Haters. Haters challenging you this morning there's work to do it is not in the arena of cultural war Micah chapter 6 verse 8 he has showed you oh man what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice everybody say justice, justice. love kindness and to walk humbly with your God I will come back when I come back to talk about how we serve our generation the first way is true mosaic passion. Seven ways. Seven ways. Mosaic passion. Mosaic passion. The second way is true strategic commitment of vision, like Joshua. Number one, mosaic passion. Number two, strategic commitment, commitment to vision. That's Joshua. Number three, clarity of vision. Clarity of vision. Like Ruth, your God will be my God. Where you go, that's where I will go. Clarity of vision. <laughs> Number three, uh, humility of heart, like David. Do you know that David was not invited to the party by his parents? A party that the whole city knew about. Think about it. You are a child in a house. The whole city knew a party was taking place. And your father will not invite you. What will most of us do? Most of us say, ah, Baba, I'm here too now. Ah, why have you not invited me? Ah, we will crash the party. What did the Bible say David did? He stayed where his father plays him. He humbled himself. When he became a servant of Saul, he humbled himself. When he fully understood God, and sin as my mother conceived. Other people may call me king, but I really know who I am. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord. I humble myself before you. I humble myself before you. People may call me great general, but I know I couldn't have killed Goliath without you. Have mercy on me, O oh God. Humility of heart. I'll talk about that another day. Isaiah, compassion. 
Oh, comfort ye my people. Comfort ye my people. Comfort ye my people. You cannot be an agent to a generation without a compassionate heart. You know, some people say, ah, let him go now. Let him go. Yeah, he's, he's that. He's that. Yeah, let him go. That's Joab. That's Joab. But David, give them food. Isaiah, have compassion on them. Jeremiah, a sorrow of art. I talk today about what I normally would not touch. Gay, lesbian. Is there any pain in your heart for these wonderful people? Or you have turned them into a creature? Is there any pain? Is there any compassion? Is there any sorrow? Has there been tears? Do you cry some for what is going on in our nation? Finally, number seven, <laughs> apostolic studentship. Apostolic studentship. You know, it takes a very humble grown adult for somebody to say, follow me, and I will make you. Ah, if I knew you, I was already living my life. What are you talking about? You will make me. Now, if I come to you today and say, follow me, and I will make you, what, what will you say? say who does he think he is? <laughs> and then he says again, learn of me. Ah, I should learn of you. Think about it. Jesus is speaking to Peter, who is most probably uncool to him. Eh? He's speaking to somebody who is far older than him and says, learn of me. <laughs> Take my yoke. Abide in me. Live by me. Go for me. Is it all about you? And he looks at you with a smile and said, yes. <gasps> and they humbled themselves. He said, it's all about me. That's what Jesus said. Who loves this Jesus this morning? Amen. Who is going to love the people on his behalf? Love this land? Love gay, straight, lesbian? Evangelical, non evangelical, Catholic, love everybody. He's going to love. Let's close by singing that song. Oh, love.